couple of more uh, presentations to sort of end the day with the bag. Uh, if you're not already awake. Um, you know, we've been talking about all the different factors that really influence what's going on in, in healthcare and behavioral healthcare today. And, and uh, you know, as I, as I really step back and look at that, it calls for, you know, us thinking about a different way of doing business. Uh, so to that end, uh, we've, we've invited uh, a very special guest today, uh, Dick Daugherty. He's the, uh, the president, uh, the CEO of DMA Health Strategies and president of the nonprofit organization Basic Needs US. Uh, does some great work through that organization. And he's a real thought leader in, in, the, in the behavioral health uh, sector, somebody I've really looked up to for a long time. And, uh, recently, I found out he's been engaged uh, to write and to help lead the writing of, of a series of articles in the journal Psychiatric Services on evidence-based practices and has been thinking about re-engineering the, uh, the, the mental health delivery system in some very exciting ways. So as we had a conversation about that, um, I, I thought it would be really wonderful to bring him in here and paint some of that picture, I think, in, a, in what hopefully will be a very provocative way. Uh, and I'm anxious to, to uh, hear the response and reaction discussion to that. So, Dick, thank you again for joining us. Thanks, Tom. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Am I on? Am I uh, Am I on now? Now I'm on. I, I'm, I'm on here, too. <laughs> so, uh, thank you, Tom. And it, it's really been a great discussion. I, I don't know what every, everybody else is thinking, but uh, uh, I, I miss David Covington, unfortunately, but, uh, uh, but it seemed like he was engaging Denny's comments, everybody's comments all the way along the line have been a, a, a progression. And picking up on what I hope to be some themes that you find in common with my presentation. Forgive the indulgence, but I'm going to ask you to walk with me th through my thought processes in getting to this this belief that we need to really fundamentally rethink the way we deliver care. And, uh, uh, and so I'm going to walk you through some history and some, some how I got to this process. The, the big place that sort of got me to this process was leading this project for SAMHSA uh, on assessing the evidence base, looking at the, uh, the research and evidence on uh, 13 different services. We've actually looked at 35. Uh, but the 13 were picked out. We had an agreement with psychiatric services to broadly disseminate it. So I'm going to sort of present some of that, but I'm going to present it in the context of the issues that the field has been facing. Um, I'm a social worker and psychologist by training. Um, I've uh, got family with, uh, that have needed services, and thankfully not very serious uh, need for the services. So I've had a, had a position of being in a place of trying to navigate uh, the system. Um, I've uh, been working for 27 years helping redesign the system, mostly at the payer level. Um, but a lot of work with nonprofits in response to payment um, uh, change, change issues. I redesigned the Massachusetts system, San Diego, worked in New York special needs plan, We've worked with Centerstone around sort of a provider-driven strategy, uh, it, numerous uh, other, other efforts. So my perspective comes at this really from a systemic perspective, and, 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 uh, uh, and I look forward to sharing that with you and then hearing the dialogue, because I think unless we start this kind of discussion, we're not going to be able to, uh, uh, to really fundamentally change the, the system in the way it needs to be changed. So I start from a fundamental premise that we're in danger of being irrelevant um, for all but the most disabled people we serve. Um, integrated care will increasingly take over more and more of the care for people uh, with depression, anxiety disorders, and early stages, of, uh, uh, early stages of many of the other conditions that comprise mental illnesses, a theme that you'll hear coming through this presentation. Those with the most disabling systems will still need the kind of care many of us deliver in many of the programs we run. Uh, but even those programs will be fundamentally changed as we think about different ways of financing, as state funds uh, uh, diminish, and as 
new integrated care models and new ways of financing services are changed. So, so, I, so I began asking myself as I was thinking about that, where and to whom will primary care practices refer people? Many of you have all been about sort of making up relationships with uh, primary care practices, some probably better than others. Um, but, <coughs> excuse me, I've got this tail end of a cough that hopefully won't be uh, disabling. Uh, the, uh, so, so who are they going to refer to? And who will the health plans want to contract with? Who do they contract with now? The, the majority of health plans have got panels of private practitioners delivering the clinic-based services. The majority of people in those private health plans go to those private practitioners. They don't come to the public sector funded, the clinic-oriented services. Now, this varies by state. Um, significantly, and, there's, and there are major differences by state. But, but how do we present ourselves to this changing market? The other thing that I've been co really concerned about as we sort of have come into this new age of integration is that I've become increasingly aware of the fact that we're a field that has had the history and a culture of victimization. To some degree, we... Uh, we, we represent or we uh, mirror our clients in some of this respect. And that's not a surprising uh, factor if you go back to Freud. Um, but, but, but to another degree, we've been marginalized. And we feel it. And so we've tried to carve everything out. And we've been under reimbursed. And so this, this culture, this history of victimization, I think, is, is really sort of been part of our sort of response to also the stigma that we feel our field represents. And so many of the efforts over the last number of years have really been trying to sort of address this issue of the field's victimization, trying to restore, if you will, the the sense that the field has something to contribute. Surgeon General's report on mental health, landmark report in 1999, was huge in that. Um, they weren't very big into graphics and back then, so that's my little clip of the front page of the 1999 graphics. Um, the IOM's report on improving uh, outcomes in mental health, huge in beginning to sort of advance the discussion around what are the outcomes now and what can we do. World Health Organization is increasingly focused in on mental health. All of this is about sort of building large governmental bodies, you know, sort of trying to lead and restore the, the, the sense or build the sense that the field has something to contribute. Surgeon General's conclusions, so there's a list of them here. The, the efficacy of mental health treatment is well established. I'm going to um, argue a little bit on that point. Um, uh, that, that we need to continue to build the science base, we need to overcome stigma, that was a big theme in the report, improve the public awareness, ensure the supply of mental health services, ensure delivery of state-of-the-art treatment, tailor treatment to age. Has any of this changed? Isn't this the same prescription now, 15 years later? I think so, as I look at it. We, we made some advances, if you think, 15 years, you know, sort of, uh, I, I was bald then still, but um, uh, I'm a little grayer. Um, uh, I, some of you in the room are probably the same, in the same boat. So we've made some advances. Uh, but this, this set of recommendations still stands. <clears throat> Out of the uh, Surgeon General's report, Bob Drake, Howard Goldman, Steve Leff from HSRI, Tony Lehman, Lisa Dixon, Kim Muser, William Torrey. This is an amazing list of sort of, sort of researchers in the field. Um, uh, uh, wrote an article for Psychiatric Services. The 2001 issue was dedicated to advancing evidence-based practices. <coughs> and, the, um, uh, and what emerged out of this, this issue and the many issues that followed were the SAMHSA toolkits. Um, so, uh, illness management and recovery, consumer family psychoed, supported employment, uh, all, the, all the toolkits that came out emerged out of this sort of 
assembly of evidence-based practices. Um, but the assembly was in a sort of program style, and they were very intense and expensive toolkits. The level of adoption of the toolkits with fidelity was de minimis. De minimis. I mean, there were certain places that picked up certain pieces of it. It certainly, it certainly raised the bar, but didn't happen. Began to change the dialogue? Yes, all that's good. Now, I don't think I like this series, but I've only seen one episode. Has anyone seen it? I, you know, sort of, I, sh I show this slide because I think what's happened since is that we've now got something like this happening on TV about a person with serious mental illness, serious bipolar disorder, in a highly professional position, uh, hiding her own secret that she's bipolar. It's a little strange how they did it in the first episode, so I'm hopeful that the later episodes do it. I urge you all to just watch once. Just watch once. And if, and if for no other reason, watch it because people with very serious mental illnesses are being displayed in a, in a compassionate way on public television in prime time. In a very compassionate way. And the, the, the leads, um, uh, theme is that medication isn't always right for people. Listen to your hallucinations, befriend your hallucinations. There are many themes that are sort of right out of the heart of some of the recovery movement. Um, uh, and, and it's a very compelling, there's, there's obviously some good science advisors. Her conditions are a little over the top at times and overly sexualized, and at the, so there's all sorts of reasons to sort of not like the series. But look at it just from the perspective of serious mental illness is being displayed not like Jack Nicholson in The Shining, but, but on public television, on public television in a compassionate way. This is a huge opportunity, potentially, I think. This is, this is where it starts becoming mainstream, some of what we do. But I still come back, we still don't fully understand why our services work. We've got glimmers of it. We've got belief in it. But we don't understand it all from the science basis. We're getting there. The neurons and the biochemical you know, sort of markers and the, the changes that are being made. The, this is, it's enormously complex. And yet, over the coming years, and increasingly, we're getting answers. And I think those answers are going to fundamentally drive the kind of change I'm talking about here and, and fundamentally drive the way in which we do business as we begin to better understand and begin to get a better sense across the board of what's uh, behind the changes in, in human behavior. <clears throat> For how many years has the DSM been in place? I'm not a clinician, you know, sort of 30, 50, I don't know, years. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual sort of has gone through various different iterations of improving diagnosis of mental illnesses, trying to improve the diagnosis. It is still an art. You all know that. It will never not be an art, so there's a, there's a reality to the sort of art, artfulness of that. But with an attempt to be scientific, they've had to go through these multiple iterations to require the accurate assessment, diagnosis, uh, and ultimately treatment uh, of mental illnesses. We need it, we've got to use it, but, but it, it, it's, an art, it's an art. ICD-9, now 10 diagnostic groups generally refer to two, 290 to 316 as the range, right? 26 different groups, each with multiple subgroups. <coughs> well over 100 different components of mental illnesses behavioral health conditions that we serve. No other sphere of health care has, has created such an extensive compendium, as if this was a good thing, um, extensive compendium of, of all its disorders um, uh, with explicit diagnostic criteria. We have to keep changing them. How good are our diagnostic um, sort of, uh, our diagnoses? 
How effective are we at diagnosing people? 50% of the time, it's right? It's, it's, not, it's not far off of that. So, some point even lower. Um, so what does that sort of say about all this science? No other field. That's, that's where I sort of come down to the Surgeon General's report about how intensive it is, but we're not right most of the time. Do we know what works? You know, is it more than we did in 99 with the Surgeon General's report? So all this sort of focus, again, has led us up to the new series. Again, remember, this is my thought process. So, it's a, so we got into the new series. We thought, you know, we're going to go look at the evidence base. We're going to start looking at all these services, and we're going to start doing it. We got partnership with psychiatric services. Howard Goldman was enormously helpful. He was a partner from the very beginning, two and a half years ago. I lost a Christmas vacation doing the, doing the first, uh, <clears throat> first round of edits on the first set of them. <clears throat> the concept was we were going to help inform the development of uh, uh, essential benefits in all the states. Uh, as health reform was coming into place, we were going to be able to say, Here the, here's the list of services, but we started with the wrong choice of services. Then we needed to get a whole new one. We went through several iterations. As I said, we did about 35. Um, SAMHSA was enormously supportive of this, getting this done right. We ended up with 13 that we pulled from it. Um, these are very thorough, consistently done reviews Looking at, the, uh, looking at the effectiveness, you'll see here behavior management for children and adolescents, trauma-focused CBT, substance abuse intensive outpatient, uh, partial hospitalization we looked at. You might say, where's some of the things that we could have looked at, and they're probably in the other 35, but we looked at a range of services, peer support, peer recovery support, um, and, and basically uh, summarized what, what we've done and uh, what the research has said. Multi-year process, I, I basically just said everything that's on that slide. So here's sort of what we came out with. Pardon to the people in the back of the room where I was today in small fonts. Maybe you can make out some of these. But <clears throat> this is my effort to sort of visually display the, the two things we rated, the level of evidence, low, and, low to high, and the level of effectiveness, low to high. Level of effectiveness was not actually rated per se. It's, it, it was just general findings, and so, for, so I am being somewhat liberal with my assessment of what the findings st stated. And these should be talk, thought about as in clusters because they don't, it's not a scattergram. <laughs> uh, it's in big clusters of scatters, uh, if you will. So high is all this sort of group, all this group of services up here, behavioral management, consumer family psychoed, methadone, substance abuse intensive outpatient, buprenorphine, trauma-focused CBT, skill building, and supportive employment <coughs> are all sort of rated as having a high degree of evidence. Three or more RCTs from independent reviewers. Uh, that was an important criteria for us. Um, so, uh, multi-systemic therapy, for instance, did, did not have many independent reviews. We didn't review it in this cluster, but did not have many independent reviews. Quality of the research seemed to be reasonably good, but, but Cochrane and most of the other sort of uh, rep, uh, review organizations would have thrown out and discounted uh, uh, those, those research studies as, as being potentially biased. <clears throat> peer support services, permanent supported housing, recovery housing, and residential treatment, a medium moderate level of evidence. <clears throat> the reason there's no level of evidence is SAMHSA is SAMHSA. <laughs> so it's a, there, there are many services that we have and that were part of the list that really didn't meet the criteria for levels of evidence uh, and would have been down in this category, but weren't part of the publication. So the effectiveness, and so here's the group at the top, consumer and family psychoed, focused on people with schizophrenia for the most part in their families. Substance abuse intensive outpatient. Now there's a big difference between those two. One's a, one's a program, one's a service. IOP is a program. Trauma focused CBT and supported employment. Again, a program. Um, behavioral management for conduct, kids with conduct disorders. <clears throat> the two medication assisted treatments. And skill building, primarily focused on people with schizophrenia. Uh, and <clears throat> those disabling conditions. Those are the services 
that have, the, that have clear evidence and strong evidence. And then we've got sort of a, a, a group of services down here that sort of cluster in the middle, varying degrees. The, the, uh, the movement to right, left to right is deliberate. There were you know, basically mixed findings from some of those. But, uh, but you get the uh, concept here. Clear, clear uh, statistical significance uh, findings. So it was not effect size. So we were not doing a uh, uh, a full uh, 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 yeah a full analysis uh, across across studies. And so that's why you you won't see that last slide in in psych services <laughs> because it's sort of it's my effort to just briefly sort of lay out what I see is sort of. Working, so it's it, it's a qualitative assessment of, of effect size in that, if you will, or effects. So here were the here were the so the issues, the takeaway issues with the with the study. <coughs> there was a lack of independence. I've already mentioned. More research is needed to study components of interventions. I'm going to come back to that theme. Diverse cultural pop populations. Excuse me. Diverse cultural populations. There was, a, there was a strong lack of comparative effectiveness. It was treatment as usual versus the intervention. Um, and it was clear that we need a national research agenda, um, that it's not being driven by anybody. It's by individual researchers who are submitting grants. <coughs> as a field, we've done a poor job of defining the specific type and intensity of interventions in our services. It wasn't clear, even in case management, um, uh, studies where it would seem to be pretty sort of straightforward, there was never cl a clear caseload identified in most of the, most of the studies. Uh, benefit, pl plans, uh, uh, benefit plans on the insurance side cover a combination of settings, programs, and services. So our attempt to try to link the research to benefit plans didn't, didn't fit well. Different outcome measures being used. The evidence for effectiveness doesn't meet the standards found in other health services. Um, uh, the dissemination of the findings lags behind the rest of the health field. And comparative and cost effectiveness research, again, is needed. <coughs> so one of the things that I became very clear on is that our attempt to look at services and our attempt to look at programs um, sort of raised for me the issue of what's going on inside those. What's really driving the way in which, so what are the interventions that are being done by all the researchers or the, or the people studying this? What do we do out in the field when we're actually meeting with people? What, what makes an ACT program work from, an, from a clinic uh, setting? And there's this whole emerging area of um, uh, research. Bruce Torpeda has, has really led this in the work that he's done with um, uh, the, both the American um, Academy of Pediatrics, as well as the uh, uh, state of Hawaii, about trying to distill and then match to eliminate duplicates, trying to distill the active treatment components of what goes on in therapy. Larry Davidson has, has had a recent article doing the same thing in consumer-related um, uh, services. What are the key elements and activities of what we go on and, and what we do when we try to engage with people? when we try to establish a therapeutic alliance. Things like active listening, motivational interviewing, um, uh, communication strategies, uh, goal-directed treatment planning. These are the kinds of components of what we do that we don't know anything about their individual effectiveness. But we do know, as, as artists, as clinicians, that they're parts of what we do. <clears throat> so I sort of then began to sort of ask the broader question. Why are things so much the same or, or worse in our community services um, since, the, since the 1990s? And some would argue worse. Uh, and the answer is, in large part, money for most, for most states. We've been under-reimbursed. We we've never had enough money for innovation. 
And so why is the money so poor, so weak, a little wording problem there, but why is the money so poor? There's a low perceived value of behavioral health um, that results in part from stigma, from the lack of a clear business case, and poor marketing, was my conclusion. Um, stigma, many people put out front is sort of front and foremost, but I think we as a field <clears throat> have followed along with that with not clearly, trying, not clearly being able to and clearly establishing a business case. How many of the research studies that we've seen, I think we've heard this today, use, use payment financial information as part of the research outcome? How many, I, I, it's very hard to find evidence of uh, children's mental health interventions. We did this for the system of care uh, grants, where there's been a lot of research on systems of care. Debbie, you and I talked about this, to try to identify whether there have been any sort of cost, cost effectiveness or cost, cost related studies. Very few, if any. The, the cost-related studies have been at the system level, wrap around Milwaukee, some of the others, pre-post <clears throat> studies, but most of the research doesn't include financial, financial outcomes. So I'm going to skip over this slide. So, so then the thought process went on. So I, was, so I was left after the assessing the evidence base with those sets of questions and those concerns. And then I read Michael Porter's new article. How many have read this? More. So more, more need to, uh, because there were, there were probably 10, 15 hands, but that's good. <clears throat> so the strategy that'll fix health here, I mean, if that didn't catch, you know, capture me, you know, sort of like, what? Okay, he's got, generally, Michael Porter's pretty good at strategy, so if he's got an idea here. Here was one of his takeaways. Providers must lead the way in making value the overarching goal. That was back to my previous point. I don't think we've done a good, very good job of that. And his <clears throat> key components here lead off with number one there, organized into integrated practice units. But his language around that was organizing around patients' condi medical conditions rather than specialties. And that got my wheels turning because that's where I think we haven't done a very good job. It's almost as if we've taken, so you can read the rest of them, you know, so they're, they're all, you know, IT's got to be part of it, and, and you know, we've got to develop bundled prices for the full care cycle, this, uh, um, all of that. But this notion about how we've organized ourselves, we haven't. It's almost as if in deinstitutionalization, we took the big box that was the state hospital, and we created lots of little boxes out in the community. And they were, they were ambulatory and they were residential and they were, and these boxes served everybody that was in the state hospital. You know, sort of we, and, and we maybe said who's ready to move. Maybe we looked at functional status and functional readiness. We did. But we, we didn't pay any attention to the patient's condition back to the diagnosis. How does somebody with bipolar Work in, the, work in a housing setting with people with serious depression, with people with schizophrenia, with personality disorders. How are we organized to, in fact, serve any of those when people come in to a clinic setting? And so what I'm going to lay out to you is what I think is one possible approach to the, to the uh, behavioral health version of integrated practice centers. It has to start with clinics. It has to start with center, what I'd call centers of excellence. Dale Jarvis and I have been working together. We're, we're, we're trying to advance this. Implementing even one evidence-based practice requires extensive training, as you know, but also has to have re-engineering of intake, screening, staff assignment, supports, and financing. So here's the sort of teaser. If you, if you were working with primary care as a new goal, what if we set up specialty teams? It's not going to happen all overnight. So just imagine, imagine a clinic setting that you operate having one specialty team. What would it look like for, for depression, uh, for trauma-related conditions? Primary care knows this. 
They know that people that they're coming with suspicion of that, they're going to refer into this evidence-based treatment team, which has a cluster of services dedicated to and devoted to that condition, which means that they know that the health education materials they pull together are going to be relevant to that condition, not just people with schizophrenia. Um, that they're going to be able to pull out and have consulting psychiatrists to be able to advise the primary care f f physician about the nature of SSRIs that to date and the kinds of, kinds, of, uh, kinds of medication that can and should be supported for people, that they're going to have psychosocial support and self-help that's focused on that specific condition. That, tr that transitional care, that, that care coordinators are all going to have a focus and an understanding of the nature of that condition. To me, as somebody who's looked for care um, uh, and imagining being in a position of certainly a, a person on Medicaid, looking and considering options for care, the notion of going to a center that has a specialization in the kind of condition I might have is much more appealing to me than going to Dr. S Dr. Smith down the street or you know, East Riverside Mental Health Center. And so there's a marketing dimension of this, absolutely, by design. Because you're not only marketing to the individual people, you're marketing to primary care. Specialty teams that could be set up could, would include ADHD autism or autism spectrum disorders, child behavior management. You can imagine them as, as well as I. The types of conditions, uh, opiate addictions, trauma and anxiety disorders. It, it, it's probably clusters, so it's not you know, down to individual conditions. And the elements need to include, I think, th these different levels. And this is just my belief. So, and not all at once, necessarily. But they clearly got to have a health education component, because we're not going to be able to, when, in, a, in a day where randomized trials are showing that bibliotherapy is every bit as effective as, as, as clinical treatment, outpatient treatment, that giving a person, prescribing a book can work just as well as prescribing treatment. We've got to be prepared to have that as a frontline strategy for most people coming into cl care. Clinical apps on smartphones, fit those in when we have them and when they work. We've got to have evidence-driven treatment, which means we've got to have treatment that mo increasingly moves towards protocols. And increasingly is driven by step-by-step -step guides for care. That's the only way we can program it into these apps on smartphones. Have you considered this? What about this? Is, is if there's some sort of protocol. And that's the only way in which um, uh, we'll be able to sort of bring costs down in care so that it's reasonable. We've got to have care coordination. We've got to build in some psychiatric consultation. These, the rest are relatively straightforward elements. So here's a, here's a take on where these points of intersection are. And the one that I want to sort of really emphasize is this first one, which is this requires, I think, an increasing focus on specialized screening and assessment, which I think is where we're some of the weakest in our field is that we can't rely on diagnosis very well. We look at, as I said, we're doing large, large analyses of claims, and the multiple diagnoses are horrendous that exist within claims records. We all know this. We, we all sort of don't rely on it even within our own agencies. So the ability and the need to standardize, to have a group of people who are specialized in that is, I think, particularly important. I don't know how to do it. You all know how to do it, I think, better than I. But I, don't th I think if we don't move in this kind of direction, we're, we're, we're missing the boat. Routine use of bibliotherapy, routine outcome measurement, and, and more protocol-based care. The barriers have been money, training. It's not clear yet what the new payers want, because we've got a lot of new payers. How do we start? What do we start with? I don't have the answers to these things. I do know that we increasingly have the data available to begin to develop protocol-based care. 
more standardized care that still can be personalized in the way we deliver it. The providers have to be the early adopters because government and payers won't be ready yet, won't move, the, move forward as rapidly as we need to. That some sort of bundled payments will be needed and right now is the time for us to shape that agenda. That a research agenda is needed to inform payers and purchasers. Um, and that a learning agenda is needed for groups just like this one. For organizations to begin start, starting to try this and starting to adopt this. Like Denny said earlier, to adopt this is going to take money that you don't have right now. I mean, you heard it earlier. It's going, your, your, your cost per unit is going to be higher than the revenue coming in at the beginning. But unless we adopt and work together to figure out some of the approaches and strategies that, that can implement things that are going to concretize care and that are going to move it in an in a, in a approach that is more protocol driven and driven around the needs of the patient, I don't think we're going to make the steps we need to as a field. So I'm sure you've got some questions. I'm, I'm sorry about the cough during this. Uh, but um, I, uh, I stand ready to attempt to take any, of, any and all of the uh, resistant among you or otherwise uh, um, for these kinds of change efforts. Thank you so much, Dick. We have time for one or two questions. Um, we, we, uh, we did this. Um, several years ago, and, and actually we were referenced in that uh, the first compendium of the evidence-based treatments, that first citation you gave uh -huh. uh, that uh, uh, Drake and those guys did. And what we found, uh, we probably, and I would argue that we probably implemented uh, evidence-based protocols with high fidelity, not, not for seriously mentally ill, but for more um, higher incidence in uh, uh, depression, anxiety, substance use problems, um, with high fidelity, and what we found was that what we learned from that was that evidence-based protocols were a necessary but not sufficient condition for research-based care to occur. That after hours and hours of training and just like clinical supervision in graduate school, only 24% of our 9,000 patients got an evidence-based protocol even though we implemented them for the most highest, highest incidence disorders. And what the, there are a number of reasons for that. One was the average evidence-based protocol has a 12 to 16 session duration. Clients come in with an expectation they're going to be seen for four to five sessions. You've got clinicians that cannot unlearn what they used to learn or what they used to know and cannot follow a protocol. Some could and some loved it, but many could not and would not. But when you look at the data, it's like there is a place, in my mind, there's a place for evidence-based protocols, but there's also a place for the aggregation of information and data and use that in a practice-based evidence model to inform care about what a clinician is doing clinically that is superior to others that may have nothing to do with an evidence-based protocol. And I, I first of all, it's, uh, you know, I, I, that may be, we may be in disagreement about that, and if so, I respect your right to be wrong. But, no. um, <laughs> but I, would, no, I actually want to hear what you, what, no. what you agree with that or what you think. Uh, I, I mean, my take on those protocols that you're referencing is that they're unrealistic. Is that, is that care is expected by most people coming into it to be about five sessions. What's your average length of care? Probably lower than that, most cases. Uh, most, in most outpatient settings, it is. Um, so that it can't be based on those protocols. Um, and I think that's, that, so that's the first piece where I t absolutely totally agree. I, I got a little worried until I heard you say those, those protocols. And, and we don't have the protocols for this. So we have to develop the protocols for this. And, and there's no science behind developing those protocols. One of the, one of the earlier statements um, uh, was, you know, out of the Surgeon General's, or no, excuse me, I read, read it, N National Health Service in, in the UK uh, has gone to protocol-based care. And it's the only way that they find that they can work in treatment teams. Because then everybody knows sort of what the expectations are for next levels of care for the next sort of type of intervention. But they also know that the, the evidence is extremely thin. Surgeon General Report said this too for, for algorithms and well, about any movement between steps and that hasn't changed between steps. So 
So we're, we're still in making this up. And we're going to be driven, and we need to be driven, by, in fact, some of the efforts to advance technology and build in some of the decision support tools that are part of um, um, these apps that you've just been talking about. It's these decision support tools, I think, that we need to be thinking about in terms of protocols, because that, those are the algorithm-like decisions, decisions that clinicians and, and a whole treatment team, a whole system, will be making about care and moving care to the next level. So, so I think we're actually in quite a lot of agreement, because I think you used a legacy set of protocols for, for what needs to be sort of a, a different solution, but still protocol driven. So, um, so thank you, though, ho however, for, for raising that and clarifying my approach to it. Yeah, please. I'm relatively speaking new in the mental health substance abuse area, and my data set is very minimal. But for what little I've seen, the cost equation in this model is, is broken. So I know one of the barriers you put is money, but there's two equations to money, right? There's revenue and a cost equation to the money. So uh, based on what uh, the research you have done and what you have looked at, um, how many of these agencies or institutions have actually gone back and taken a look at reducing the cost of operation without changing the revenue equation? I think every year, every couple of months, virtually everybody's looking at reducing the cost of care. Are they thinking differently about the process of care in order to reduce costs? I suspect everybody here is, but they're not quite sure what the package looks like or where to, where to intersect the, 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 the system redesign that would occur. I mean, if, so if, if, if I were a venture capitalist coming off an earlier discussion and wanting to invest in sort of this, the current behavioral health delivery system, you know, what would I do? I'd be moving in this kind of direction, and I'd probably get rid of most of the legacy staff and retool completely with a type of, you know, sort of a, a type, a group of staff who are prepared to and able to follow some sort of guidelines for care and are, that are prepared to implement some of these lower cost options with clinical and psychiatric support but not with the level of clinical and psychiatric involvement we have now, not the 13 to 15 you know, session you know, sort of models that we've built coming out of this research base, coming out of this idealized but legacy set of approaches towards care. And I think, if, I mean, if you look at mindfulness, if you look at you know, sort of what we're learning increasingly about mindfulness-related activities, those are all self self-actualized uh, kinds of behaviors, those can be taught. What are we doing in groups to teach those kinds of activities within most of our centers? We're not reimbursed for, for most of that now. And the challenges of setting up clinical groups have been big for most of us. So most, most clinics don't do a lot of groups. How many, how many of you do more than 5% of your clinical volume in group settings? One set of hands from the same provider, a couple, 10%. I mean, so we're not doing, I think, the kinds of things we need to consider doing in scale. And if we do it, then we're moving towards more of an educational model. If we can think of it in more of an educational model, it reframes the nature of the group. What if when everybody came into a center, they were given a book to read and an option of several different groups they could attend to learn more about their condition? What if that's the front line for, for all of our services, ambulatory services? I think, thanks, Nick. I'm, I'm going to have to, yeah. in the interest of time, move on. But, but um, we'll have, we're going to move on to our final speaker, but we'll have time for more discussion after that. So. Excellent. Thank you. Very good. Thank you.